Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another week of Trauma Recovery University. I'm your host, Athena Moberg, and with us in the green room, of course, is your incredible co-host, Bobby Parrish. Thank you so much for being here for live Q&A Monday. Are you in the right place? If you are an adult survivor of childhood abuse, specifically childhood sexual abuse, this is live Q&A Monday, and you are in the right place. I'm Athena Moberg, my business partner Bobby Parrish and I are both adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse and we show up here every single week and we support the survivor community in over 70 countries and we answer your questions. You send us your questions on Twitter using the hashtag no more shame or you send us an email to no more shame project at gmail.com or you send us a Facebook message to Trauma Recovery University on Facebook, and we answer your questions. And that's how we get our topics for every single week. This week's topic is managing PTSD, triggers, and emotional flashbacks in the workplace. This can be so difficult. So many of us are employed. And every single person in the entire world that has a job has job stress or work-related stress. Add on top of that PTSD, emotional flashbacks from complex PTSD, or triggers from either classic or complex PTSD due to any trauma that you've incurred, whether that is a, an assault in your adult life, childhood trauma, childhood sexual abuse, any type of child abuse, um, witnessing a natural disaster, uh, veterans that come back from war. There are so many different contributing factors to post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And when you add all of those things together, especially taking into consideration the cumulative nature of trauma, and then you add on top of that job stress or work stress or an environment that you're not able to really control because there are so many different influences, outside influences coming at you from every single direction, from a boss that might be difficult to please, to gossipy coworkers, to people who decide that they're going to be loud and crude and rude in the break room, or people that are over by the lockers and they're making crazy noises or they're talking about things that are just highly inappropriate or triggering to you. And all of that combined is just a huge, huge pile of stress and a meltdown waiting to happen. So have no fear. We are here to share with you some tips and strategies that can really help you plan ahead for times like this if you know certain things that will trigger you. Now, it's kind of counterintuitive to think, oh, sure, well, don't you think if I knew I was gonna get triggered that I wouldn't get triggered? And like, that's, you know, it's still hard, Athena. Well, Bobby and myself understand this. We have not always worked from home. We both have worked high stress jobs. I worked in corporate America for many, many years. Bobby was a therapist. Bobby also worked for um, a trauma line where she answered telephone calls and fielded telephone calls from people. And she'll talk about that later on in our one page. And, you know, we've, us and as well as our, our loved ones and our family members, we know what it's like to be out in different job situations. So managing job stress on top of PTSD or complex PTSD, understanding emotional flashbacks, understanding triggers, sort of being able to think ahead of time and know like certain things that do trigger you and how to plan ahead for those times um, by setting yourself up for success, we are going to go over everything in detail today, line by line by line by line, ways to equip you and help you if this describes anything that you are dealing with right now. So if you're listening on a podcast platform or you have found us anywhere but on our Roku television channel or our YouTube channel, please go over there and look for us by doing a search for Trauma Recovery University. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Trauma Recovery University TV or on any Roku device by searching for Trauma Recovery University. We have two websites and tonight, actually we have three. Tonight we're launching our third website and um, 
are two websites where you can get tonight's complimentary downloadable resource. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for watching. Watching. Thank you for listening. We want to give you access to tonight's complimentary downloadable PDF resource. You are welcome to print that out, put it in a notebook, share it with someone you love if you know that they're struggling. And you can get that by going to one of our two websites, either nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com. And then tonight we are launching a third website um, to tell you more about our conference coming up in November in Orlando, Florida. And Bobby's going to tell us a lot more about that. So welcome, welcome. Thank you to each and every one of you that show up here early and support one another on the Twitter stream. If you are showing up for the very first time, we want to say a very special hello and welcome. And go ahead and just say hello to us on Twitter or interact with us. Use the hashtag no more shame and you can go ahead and tag us. And if you are watching us on a replay and you don't want to listen to everyone's questions and you only want to watch the screen share one page comment, you can go down in the description section just before you get to the comments of this video. And there is a number that says if you're watching a replay and you don't want to listen to people talk, you can click this number. And you'll fast forward straight to the one page sharing. So either way, we are just grateful that you're here. Always just take what you need, take what is best, and leave the rest. We're just here to provide re a resource to you and support and encouragement and to add value to your recovery journey. So there is no Tupperware, multi-level anything. We don't need you to join anything. We're just happy you're here. And we're grateful to be a resource and a source of encouragement for you. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to my business partner, Bobby Parrish, who will bring us up to date on some exciting things going on in our community and issue a trigger warning and all kinds of other fun stuff. So take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here tonight, and we're honored that you're here and that you spend time with us each week. Um, I want to issue a trigger warning for tonight's broadcast. The broadcast does discuss childhood abuse and specifically discusses childhood sexual abuse at times. Um, never anything explicit, but we reference it. So um, we want to let you know that if you feel triggered, it's okay to um, turn the broadcast off or turn off the recording if you're listening or watching on a podcast or a video format and come back to it later after you're feeling better, more grounded and less triggered. Or if you find that this topic just doesn't work for you, it's not applicable, um, then go ahead and, and shut it down. Um, we try to pick topics that are wide enough to apl apply to most survivors, but not all of them do. So we're not offended if this one doesn't work for you. And we invite you just to shut it down and go on to the next video. Um, if you are in crisis tonight or you're triggered and you need help, if you're in the United States or Canada, we encourage you to reach out to RAIN. RAIN is the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. They are available at 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. They also have a 24-7, 365, crisis chat feature on their website, rain.org, R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. If you're in the UK, you can reach out to the Samaritans. The Samaritans are an incredible, incredible resource. In the UK, they have hotlines, texting, emails, they even have offices that you can go into um, locally. So you can reach out to the Samaritans um, at their hotline number, which is 116123. I'm gonna take my sticky and I'm gonna put it up here so I don't have to look down and away from you. <laughs> you can also reach, also reach out to the Samaritans via text. And that number is 0775909090. Or you can email the Samaritans at joe, J-O, at samaritans.org. If you are in Australia, where we have a growing number of followers and watchers of our broadcasts, you can reach out to your national hotline at 131114. I see the problem with having it up there is my eyes are so old that I have to kind of... <laughs> my, my eyes are almost as old as your eyes, so watch it there. <laughs> 
don't know if you have to tattoo it on my hand or something. Or, heaven forbid, maybe memorize it. Um, <laughs> we're so excited to have you here tonight. I mean, we're excited to have you here anytime. If you're watching this at 4 in the morning or you're watching this at 2.30 in the afternoon, whenever you're watching this, especially if you're live, we're always excited and honored to have you here. But tonight, we have a special amount of excitement because tonight we are opening registration for the very first Trauma Recovery University live conference. It will be held in Orlando, November 11th, 12th, and 13th at the Lake Buena Vista Embassy Suites. You may now go to the website, Trauma Recovery University Live dot com. I'm going to let Athena show it to you and talk you through it. But first, I am going to let you know that the website is absolutely, positively incredible and was created pretty much from scratch by our incredible technical wizard, Athena, with the help of Matt surviving my past. So I am deeply grateful to both of them. And I wanna make sure that everyone knows that the website was created solely by their hands and their brains. So um, I'm gonna turn this over to Athena, but I wanna make sure that the whole world knows how grateful I am for how hard they have worked for the last six weeks to birth this website and make it as easy as possible for all of you to register for the conference and get all the information that you need in order to attend the conference. So back at you, Ms. Athena. <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys, I don't even know how to explain to you what a labor of love this website has been. Um, I didn't even know how to create a website a few years ago and I put myself through school and learned about online business so that I could be a better business coach and here I am building crazy awesome websites for this community and it is just my greatest honor. So I can't wait to unveil this to you. I'm going to show you briefly right now, uh, take you through our baby and I just want to say a very special, I'm looking right at you, Matt, Matt, thank you for all of your help with this. Oh my gosh, Matt is, Matt's amazing. We've worked very closely together over the past six weeks. He's an engineer by trade and he is our IT professional at Trauma Recovery University. Um, he's a volunteer and he serves this community um, just endlessly and just- Tirelessly. Tirelessly <laughs> and he's supportive in every way. So. Thank you for being my partner in crime on this awesome website project. I'm so proud to unveil it to you right now, our community. Very briefly, here we go. And present to everyone. Bobby, can you see it? I can, it's beautiful. Awesome, all right. Okay guys, so this is our baby. Athena Moberg and Bobby Parrish present Trauma Recovery University Live, Orlando 2016, Friday, November 11th through Sunday, November 13th, 2016 at the beautiful Embassy Suites by Hilton, Orlando Lake Buena Vista Resort. You can click here and book your discounted room for our event. Our objective is to improve care and outcomes for survivors of childhood sexual abuse through trauma-informed care. Um, that is the objective of this entire year and of pretty much this project that we took on in 2014. Um, here's some graphs uh, talking about the percentage of girls and the percentage of boys who have been reported to have been sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Compliments of our friends over at Rain, of course. Talks about the last two years, what Bobby and I have done, and we're pleased to announce the following workshops and keynotes have been confirmed. And at the bottom of every page, you will find this. This is our concierge desk. We will personally notify you regarding updates and discounts. All you do is plop your email address in here, and you click, yes, I want updates and discounts. And we have yet to send out 
very many emails to our 1300 and something whatever subscribers um, we just haven't had time to email you and keep in touch with you so we apologize <laughs> um, but we it's my goal to, to keep in closer touch with you and to send you more emails especially uh, regarding updates and discounts as that pertains to this event so you plop in your email address here and you click yes I want updates and Hopefully it will go through and it won't say, our apologies, there was a problem processing your request. It's probably our fault. Please give it another try. Um, but this is at the bottom of every page in case you just want to know what's going on and we'll email you. Um, to learn more about this life-changing event, this will take you to the About page or you can just click right over to Register Now. So um, I'll just show you the About page really briefly and then I'll turn this back over to Bobby and we'll go into some one-page comment or answer some questions that are being tweeted in by you. So um, you all are very familiar with what we are about here at Trauma Recovery University. This is to educate the general public who are not familiar with us and for corporate sponsors who are interested in becoming a part of this movement and just sharing a spark of hope with the survivor community. Um, I was um, emailing back and forth with Matt today regarding um, an optional event that I want to add to our agenda for the conference and the, the event is actually called Spark of Hope. So um, more about that. It hasn't been added to the calendar yet. I've yet to even discuss it with Bobby. I'm sort of dropping it in her lap right now. Um, yay! Are, <laughs> yay! You're all of all. You're always all about the spark of hope, so I'm not worried. But. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll love it, by the way. So here is an image that I created for one of our banners. Um, this is just, again, some, um, some stats that you all are very, very familiar with. Um, but did you know that victims of sexual assault are three times more likely to suffer from depression, six times more likely to suffer from PTSD, which is right on topic with tonight? 13 times more likely to abuse alcohol, 26 more times, 26 times more likely to abuse drugs, and four times more likely to contemplate suicide. So if you think about it, the mental health issues and the drug and alcohol addiction and suicide can be very directly linked back to uh, being sexually abused before your 18th birthday. There's a huge correlation there. So. Um, you move on down to talks again about our objective here at Trauma Recovery University Live. This talks a little bit about the multifaceted goal that Bobby and I have had from day one, which is raising awareness about childhood sexual abuse, preventing childhood sexual abuse, raising awareness about the lasting impact and the devastating effects of childhood sexual abuse, and providing education, resources, and support for adult survivors, all from a trauma-informed perspective, of course. Um, this is my favorite picture of us that we um, when we very first got a chance to meet one another in Dallas, Texas um, when I got flown out for the CyberDest event and there are buttons here where you can register now. Um, this talks about how we're bringing uh, survivors and helping professionals together under one roof to learn from one another and this is an area where you can have all of your questions answered regarding the location of the event the attire, what's the weather like in Florida, what are the local attractions, what kind of meals are we gonna be serving, we'll update this with a menu, uh, hotel information, and this is a fragrance-free conference. I love this little guy, this little drop here with a little happy face, he makes me happy. And if you're traveling by air, this will take you even directly to like, if you click on any of these boxes, they take you directly to um, any like, extra information that we have. Like this is all about Walt Disney Resort and SeaWorld and Universal Studios. And um, and then of course, if you have more questions, just um, sign in at our concierge desk and we'll contact you personally. And I do want to just make mention, and then I'm gonna turn this back over here. There, it, You can save up to 50% when you register before September 1st. So that's a good month and a half from now, a little bit over a month from now, um, as we are recording tonight's broadcast. And here, if you know any corporations or businesses that would like to become an official sponsor of this event, we have a, an official conference brochure that we will be advertising their services and we have plenty of different opportunities for people to get involved and to support the important work we do with the survivor community. So 
Um, I'm super duper proud. Um, this register page here is sort of the big daddy of all pages, and it shows your general admission option, professional admission, VIP all access pass. Here's a printer friendly version for people that want to print it out and mail it in. And then of course there are some live stream options where all you have to do is download the live stream app for free and you can watch the event live from your living room and feel like you're there with us. So choose a package. If you can't attend, of course you can buy a live stream ticket here. And that's about it. I could probably spend all day looking at this website. I know it like the back of my hand, but I'm gonna I'm gonna come back over and hang out with you guys because that is why I'm here is to hang out with you. So um, thank you all so much for spending the last few minutes looking at our <laughs> passion project, our labor of love, and just thank you for all of your support. Um, I've gotten a lot of messages from each of you. Athena, I haven't seen you around in any of our support groups lately. Are you okay? It's not like you to not be in our support groups, Athena. Athena, you haven't responded to my tweets. Athena, you haven't responded to my email. Athena, I private messaged you on Facebook and you have not responded in like a month. Is something wrong? And I'm here to tell you, no, nothing's wrong. Everything's right. <laughs> and um, this project just takes 100% focus when you want to put out an excellent product. You guys deserve the very best. I want you to know that that's where my heart is in this. We have often received the crumbs of life, and I don't think that that is what we deserve. I really feel like you guys deserve the very, 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 very best that we have to offer you. And this website is top-notch, the best technical um, presentation of everything that we could possibly give you. And it is smooth, and it's easy, and we've tested it, and just Matt and I have spent countless hours um, going back and forth on conference calls and Skypes, and um, we need to have a little button on there that talks about how many cups of coffee or bags of Funyuns or bottles of Diet Green Iced Tea or cans of Diet Dr. Pepper that have been consumed on that website, because that would be a pretty funny little graphic to put on there for you. But um, We've 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 spent a lot of time and we're really proud of it. So thanks for sitting through that little presentation, and um, I'm really grateful to be back on the topic that we are that we are talking about tonight, which is how to effectively manage PTSD triggers and flashbacks and even emotional flashbacks um, in the workplace. And a real quick shameless plug here for Richard Grannon and Layla Lorick. You guys already know that we're huge fans of theirs. They have two books that I want to recommend to you. It'll cost you 10 or 15 bucks just for, each, for both of them. You'll get both of them for like 10 or 15 bucks total. Um, one of them is How to Stop an Emotional Flashback. Okay, let's just pause and just let that hang in the air for a minute. If anyone here knows what it's like to have an emotional flashback and how completely debilitating it can be and how you can be so fun for a loop for hours or even days because something you don't even know what it was you have all of the symptoms of a flashback and you have no clue what it was that triggered it hello how to stop an emotional flashback by Richard Grannon and Layla Lorick Harriet could you I'll ask me for the links and link them below in the description of this video and then the second book just came out today and they're giving away, if you give them, if you buy the book and then leave a review, they're giving you a whole bunch of free, like, guided stuff and, like, step-by-step -step things. And it's called The Ten Things That Narcissists Don't Want You to Know. And so many of us, our childhood abuse or childhood sexual abuse was as a result of a personality disordered family unit. And if that's you, if that's not you, then, you know, take the best, leave the rest. But if that is you... Check out those two books. Check out Richard Grannon's YouTube channel and Layla Lorick's YouTube channel. His YouTube channel is Richard Grannon, the Spartan Life Coach, and Layla Lorick's YouTube channel is NAVS Recovery, Narcissistic Abuse Victim Syndrome, NAVS, N-A-V-S. And um, Harriet, also, as we're going through um, this video, if you could please pop up the videos that we have in our video library on PTSD, 
and complex PTSD, as Bobby is mentioning them in the one page, that would be amazing. Just so you got, we want you guys to have easy access to everything that we're going to be talking about tonight. But this is a huge topic. This is one that was actually sent in to us by one of our community members. It's in our co-ed support group. And you know who you are. You requested this topic. I didn't get your permission to say your name, so I won't say it. Um, but this topic is for you and for all of the other people who sent us messages saying, how do you manage triggers? How do I manage my PTSD? How do I hold down a job? How do I not lose my job because of my PTSD? This is so hard. This is so hard. Help us. So, um, Bobby, are there any questions on the Twitter stream that you would like to address or should we jump into our one page? People are talking about how difficult it really is for them in reality to, you know, it's one thing when we talk about these issues, you and I, um, and they're just kind of concepts, Yeah. but it's wonderful when our survivors give us real life examples Yeah. of what it's like and yeah. share with us, yeah, you're right, that is, it is really stressful, um, you know, Mert saying, I don't, I don't seem to have a real thick skin when it comes to dealing with conflict and, you know, other things on the job. And I think for many survivors, that's true. While we learn to cope with a lot of stuff, I don't know that we ever developed the armor for it not to bother us. Mm. You know, I mean, we can cope I, with stuff like crazy. I feel like I've been told that my whole life. Like I was, I think, I feel like I've been told that. I want to, I want to just acknowledge Mert and just say, you're not alone because from the time I was little and I would be, like, whether it was mentioning my abuse or what was happening or with bullying or the unfair treatment I was receiving, or even just as an adult, like even no, I, as far back as I can remember, I was told, Oh, just just ignore it. Just don't even let it bother you. Just water off a duck's back, Athena. Water off a duck's back. Don't even let it bother you. Just seriously, it's not worth your time. But Bobby, how much easier said than done is that? Seriously. Well, you know, when we were kids, we had to constantly be monitoring the emotional temperature of the environment around us because that was how we could try to stay safe. It didn't always work out. Uh, but no. We've, yes. it's part of our hypervigilance and it's part of our survival mechanism. So you can't, yes, you can, you can turn it off. You can change <laughs> it, but it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. And, um, it's not one of the screaming demands that our mind puts upon us. You know, uh, so many times we're figuring out just how to live through the day that to tackle turning down our um, emotional perceptions seems like a smaller item. But it really begins to make things hard when you're out in the environment working. When you work from home, that counts too. You know, it, it doesn't eliminate the stress when you get to work from home. And there's no elimination of stress when your job is full-time mom or full-time dad. You know, that's not like, at least when you go to work, most of the time you have the federal protection of being able to take breaks and vacations. Yeah, there's no, you don't get to, I, it's that commercial, you know, where the, the mom or dad sticks their head in the door and their, you know, their nose is dripping and they're carrying a tissue and they're saying to their child, their little tiny toddler, I'm so sorry, Dave, I'm going to have to take a sick day tomorrow. <laughs> and the child just looks at them like, I don't even know what you just said, you know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I um, wish it did sometimes. I remember yeah. when I was raising my son, like some days I didn't start working from home until, I don't know. I mean, even then I had to go into an office at some point. But you can't just tell your child like, oh, sorry. Yeah, I can't parent today. You're going to have to parent <laughs> yourself and change your own diapers, okay? Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. tell the rest of your family, like, oh, you know, make your own dinner. Sorry, house, yeah. you're going to have to clean your own self, house. Okay, house, thanks. Yeah. Like, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Or, remember, like, 
Bobby, remember, um, it was like a year ago or yeah, around a year ago. Remember I was, wor I've been working from home now for a few years, but remember I was living in a very, very, very triggering environment due to some, um, visitors. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. We had visitors that were extended visitors for like over a year, like a year and a half. We had extended people that were staying with us and it was down to, and it was just very, 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 very triggering. And there was never a moment when there wasn't noise or something going on in my home. I mean, I couldn't focus or concentrate. Yeah. And, you know, some for, for some of us, we need to create a safe place for us. For most of us, if not all of us, we need to create a safe place for us that can always be a safe place. Even if our home, I mean, in a perfect world, your home will be a refuge. Right. Because it right. never was when you were little. Right. In a perfect but, world. In a, yeah. But, but if you can't create your home to be a safe place or a refuge, there needs to be one spot in the planet, whether it's a corner of a room or your car. Like, I love being in my car. I love being in my truck. I have a little Ford Ranger. I love my truck. And... When the rest of the world is going to, as Bobby says, to heck in a handbasket, I jump in my truck and I, all is right in the world. Yeah. Anything could be going on all around me and I don't even care because I love my truck. I could go on a drive. I mean, if I were to drive around this whole island, it would take about 12 hours to make it all the way around. And I'd be the happiest person alive there's no cell service in most of the spots I'd be going to and but yeah. Bobby like not everybody has that not everybody has no. the option to just find a safe place no you know I can remember when I was married and we would go on vacation okay quote-unquote vacation because what it meant was going um, to a foreign country and staying with his family there was no vacation for me. I was still cooking for four children. I was still washing clothes. I was still taking care of four children. Um, yeah, no, that wasn't vacation. <laughs> so, you know, parenting, yeah, my heart goes out to everyone for whom parenting is their full-time job. Uh, there's no there's rarely a vacation in that job. And it comes with all sorts of special sets of, of stress, uh, all, you know, all on its own and being responsible for a little person, which is incredible. But I'm, my heart is breaking for the people who are sharing tonight about their experiences on the workplace. You know, Jody said I was discriminated against when I had no choice but to tell former bosses I had PTSD. August says, my boss told me to snap out of it the other day, which really hurt because I am truly trying. And then a tweet later, she said, I got kicked off my project I was in charge of. Oh no. And that's horrible. And I am so sorry that that happened to you, August. You didn't deserve that. Um, and Phoenix said, uh, I've been told to just snap out of it. Yeah, like if only I could, that's going to solve the problem. No. Jen's talking about how she had a client the same name as her abuser, and she had to be sickeningly sweet to him. Oh my gosh, that would be so. Oh, Jen. Jen, just Jen. Oh, yeah. honey. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. I have. I have similar, like someone who, rem like I, uh, I remember having clients that reminded me a lot of my abusers, and it was, it is nauseating at best, and very triggering and debilitating at worst, and just tearful, tearful drives home, and um, even um, Jody, Aloha Ohana, Jody's saying that. Um, Oh, I just lost her tweet. I'm sorry, but Jody was Jody was saying something similar. Uh, yes, and and Jody was actually talking about how she used to have to hide in the restroom, and she has was in there having panic attacks. That's horrible. 
it's hard enough to have PTSD, but then to know that your only safe refuge is the bathroom, that that's awful. Um, I've definitely spent some time in the bathroom and I had a narcissistic coworker. Um, she would rat me out to my boss for going into the bathroom and crying. Like she would go tell on me and complain that I was spending too much time in the bathroom. It was just like, it was heartless, heartless and cold. It was horrible. Um, I didn't know she was narcissistic at the time. I didn't even know what that word meant. But I mean, in, in hindsight, I now know what, you know, that that's just, I mean, talk about lacking empathy. I mean, I was literally melting down and not okay. And she was like, suck it up, buttercup type of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, August, um, I'm so sorry. You and know, so Simi, I think we were yeah. just holding <laughs> in. <laughs> You go, Bobby. You talk to Simi. Simi, we love you. <laughs> you know, I, I, she brings up a point which is so true that I don't think people tell us this one when we become parents or before we become parents. She said, as a homemaker and a mother, I've learned it's possible to be triggered by your own children, and that's hard. And that is so bang on. We can get triggered by our children. Uh, not intentionally by something, but um, yeah. Our children can trigger us. Um, my little boy, when he was a little boy, he's not anymore, now he's 5'8", goodness grief, um, used to like to, when he was little, um, come in in the morning, crawl up into bed, and jump around on my bed. Well, he was a toddler, and he didn't have a lot of recognition of where his arms and legs were going. And inevitably, he would fall on me. He would jab me with an elbow in the head or to the gut or something, not intentionally. But holy moly, did that trigger me. Being in bed, being hurt, oh my goodness, it was horrific. Um, but it, it, you know, And it was so hard because I'm thinking, he doesn't mean it. I shouldn't feel this way. What's the matter with me? Um, and sometimes he would like, mommy, what's wrong? Um, it was, it was no fun. So yes, your children can trigger you. Um, and that is one thing that we really need to be aware of as parents and not feel guilty or ashamed about because mm -hmm. it happens. Yeah, most definitely. We do get triggered by our kids. I know that I would get triggered by my son. I remember lashing out at him one time. I mean, I'm not making excuses. I definitely went and got help. I talked about this on several broadcasts before, but I raged out at my son. I was telling him um, that he was doing something on purpose just to hurt me. And I didn't understand why I would ever think that. And he would just look at me and be like, why would I ever do that, mommy? And I mean, it breaks my heart to even think about it right now because he wouldn't. But I was applying prior truths and circumstances to my relationship with my son, which was I was raised in an environment where I was bullied and tortured and beaten and abused and neglected and not given proper food or care and yelled at and gaslit and manipulated and stolen from and bullied. It was just horrible. And I never processed it. I never even dealt with it. I just sort of was like, suck it up, buttercup. Like, that's your life. That's what you've been dealt. Like, move on. Make a life for yourself. I didn't ever process or feel any of my feels. And I took it all out on my innocent child. And so I went and got help, obviously. And I realized through a very awesome counselor who told me, Athena, those things that you just described to me that happened to you are outrageous. And it is natural for your body and your mind to rage out. I'm glad you're getting help because your son doesn't deserve it. And so that was the beginning of my healing journey and sort of this path. And that was 16 and a half years ago. So here I am 16 and a half years later and I don't have rage and I don't have displaced anger and it feels really good and I feel free. Um, but recovery is a long, 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 long road and there were not trauma informed resources and support and virtual groups and Facebook and YouTube. And there was not all of that going on until later, like, like six or seven years later, and I didn't even know how to use it all until a few years after that. <laughs> so, um, so grateful 
I wanted to mention, Bobby, um, on, uh -huh. the Twitter, on the Twitter stream, um, Angel was told by her human resources department that the bullying she was incurring at work was in her head and that she was just being too sensitive. Angel, I want to acknowledge that that is not correct. Bullying is wrong. And that human resources person that told you that should probably be written up by her boss. And if they're the director of human resources, they should be fired and then replaced by someone who understands um, proper, I mean, there's there's all kinds of, like, um, here we have HMSA, that's in Hawaii, but I don't know what you guys have. Um, and we have HMLA. We have all kinds of different things that protect us, the employees, from people saying things like that and getting away with it. I was, I was horrifically bullied by two bosses at the same time, and I was like brought into a meeting and completely blindsided. And when I told them what was going on and I went to the doctor and the doctor actually said like, it seems like you may have had a mental breakdown. Like what stress are you under? And I described it and they're like, this happened to you at work? And they were blown away and they wrote this long ass letter that I had to take to my human resources department. And needless to say, I had a 30 day leave of absence and my job was completely secure and everything and it was paid and it was that person was no longer there and I got I got to go to another department I got recruited to a different department and I got a raise it was awesome so I'm not saying that it all happens good like that and that there can be whistleblower stuff and there could be you know um, what do they call that when it hit, comes back and it hits you um, when like you tell somebody and then you get punished for telling yeah that's a whistleblower yeah, there's like, re, yeah. Re, it's re... Repercussions? Repercussions, maybe. Uh, my brain hurts right now from... That's stuff, okay. So. We understand what you're saying. Yeah, and even Maggie was saying when she was in the workforce in the culinary industry, she was often triggered by the kitchen. And she would cook for a living if she could. Um, oh, rar! it's Laura. <laughs> her boss is a jerk. He told her that she couldn't take days off for her psychology and that was that it was all in her head he also loves triggering me fun not fun no no and no that's not okay i hope that there is some way that you can report that person oh my goodness and it's not you guys we're not saying we're not trying to stick a little band-aid on your bullet wound as you're hemorrhaging out everywhere and saying you should just tell somebody and it's all going to be better that's not what we're saying this totally sucks and the system is broken and the problems we have are systemic problems and we can't fix the system overnight or just by giving you a couple of little tips and tricks and strategies. But what we want to do is we want to equip you with real life things that can help you sort of set yourself up for success when you are dealing with BS like this. Because this is injustice. This is tragic. These, the way you guys are treated and what's going on. This is horrible. This is not okay. And so we want to show you a lot of compassion. And um, even Phoenix is saying she has unsafe colleagues who talk about her, her issues behind her back. And, and she says, if only they knew I have complex PTSD. But even when people know that we have PTSD or complex PTSD, I got told by a loved one the other day, oh my gosh, Bobby, you would have been so proud of me. Oh my gosh, I went off. I got told by a loved one the other day that um, that people need to stop, they need to stop complaining about like mental illness and stuff and um, that medication is only a temporary fix anyway. And they need to find a way to change their lifestyle to um, help them to heal. And while that is a true statement, it wasn't said with enough compassion for my taste, so I went off. And I said, so if someone was standing in front of you right now, Bobby, this is your example, and they, and they were a diabetic, would you tell them, oh, you just need to hurry up and get over that little insulin thing? I mean, come on, really? I mean, isn't it about time you got over that little insulin thing? I mean, it's not, it's not a forever fix. It's just a temporary fix. Like, you just need, you just need to get past that, right? Would you tell a diabetic that? Oh, you wouldn't? Okay, well, I have an entire community of people that are dealing with some mental health issues that they incurred because they were sexually abused and traumatized as children and they have been suffering their whole entire lives and they're going to die if they're not on their medication. So are you going to tell them it's time for them to get past that? I don't think so. Yeah. No. Drop the mic. 
Yeah, I, I, I would die if I weren't on my medication. That is how bad my depression gets if it's not medicated. Um, it's just my reality. Uh, would it be wonderful to go through life and not have to take medication? Absolutely. Is it going to happen? Probably not. You know, not unless they develop some kind of new depression treatment in the next, you know, 20, 25 years. So uh, I wish, I wish I could not have to take it, but it's not an option unless I want to die. And I don't. <laughs> no, so. and we don't want you to die either because we kind of like having you here with us. <laughs> Um, Sarah, beautiful Sarah, I love when your avatar has your beautiful face. Sarah says that um, she works around kids and getting hit by kids at work always triggers her, but she has to deal with the situation and she doesn't, and she doesn't have time to deal with what she's going through. And I just, Sarah, I want to validate that that is difficult and painful. I worked at a daycare center when I was pregnant with my son and I was violently ill all the time and I didn't know that I was triggered by kids. And I couldn't figure out why. I didn't even know what a trigger was. I was only 18 years old. And it was horrible, horrible, horrible. And they would be hitting me. And, they, and there were different smells and things and stuff. And they were just mean. And, and it was just, it was bad, really bad. So, Sarah, I'm thinking of you. And I'm holding a safe place for you, hoping that there's something that you can do that can, like, we're going to do the one page here. And we're going to share some ways that we can sort of set ourselves up for success ahead of time since we know that these workplace situations are potentially triggering so that and, and again I know I said it before but please go down into the description section of this video once Harriet puts it back up and that how to stop an emotional flashback book from Layla Lorick and Richard Grannon priceless and they have another book there's another book on his website about PTSD and complex PTSD and um, it, there's like a there's a first aid one as well. So anyway, you should just binge watch her whole channel It'll only take you like 40 minutes and you can binge watch his channel, which would take you about a week and a half. But um, but there's lots of help there, lots of resources there that will help you feel equipped and feel not so crazy. I know that sounds like it's very not politically correct of me to say that, but I feel less crazy. Matt and I were talking about this on during chat, I think. This morning, I feel less crazy and I feel more validated and more supported and more quote unquote normal what is normal. When I read books, there are entire sections of libraries and bookstores that are all set up for the stuff that we deal with as survivors, meaning we're not alone. There are so many people out there in the world that deal with the same stuff that we deal with whether they were abused or traumatized in some other way or they're dealing with different mental health issues. Some of us have incurred permanent brain damage because of the years of ongoing abuse that we endured as children. Like our brains will never, ever, ever, ever be fully good and fully fixed. Now we manage it and we have things like EMDR where we can make new memories and we have um, safe place um, visualization and we have all kinds of different modalities that are trauma-informed that will help us but it doesn't change the fact that we're dealing with permanent brain damage as a result of someone else's crap that they did to us and that is not okay the level of injustice that goes on for that like for survivors across the board the stuff you're dealing with right now the fact that you're even on this channel is a result of someone else doing something to you when you were a child and you didn't have the power of choice and it was done to you and you're here with us and it's not that we're not happy to see you because we are super 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 happy that you're here but we really wish no one had to be here because this is a hard place to be being on this channel means that you were abused as a child and no one should be abused so I think I'm going to step down off my soapbox. I'm going to take a deep breath here. But we want we just want to support you and I just I want to just acknowledge that so many of you are going through so much and we don't want to minimize it by sticking a little band-aid on it and saying, "Here you go. Here's some tips and tricks and strategies." But we really want to equip you with some things that you can like think ahead and like 
best practices that you can put into place like every day, every day, every day, like a system, something to add to your daily regimen, something that really brings you peace over a long period of time. And I want to say hi to Lindy because she's here. <laughs> um, August just asked a good question and I want to talk about this because I think a lot of there's a lot of discussion among survivors about this particular issue and she asked do I have to disclose my PTSD to my supervisor um, no you don't there's no law that says that you have to disclose any illness at any time to your employer if you would like to access the legal rights available to you in the Americans with Disabilities Acts, which allows you to ask for accommodations due to your disability, then yes, you have to disclose it. And if you want more information about that, it's as simple as going to ada.gov. And there are also state agencies who can help. Athena mentioned um, Hawaii has a couple. I'm not sure what they're called in each state, but each state should have some organizations that will help you with issues in employment and disability. Um, you do not have to disclose. And frankly, they don't have the right to ask. So, but it's a personal decision. It's up to you. We had someone this morning in chat say that now she does disclose. Every time she puts in an application for a job, she puts, I have PTSD. And people were like, wow, that sounds like, you know, that would end up not getting you a lot of responses. You know, people would not want to hire you. And she said, I find that that's far better than getting on the job and realizing that they're going to treat me terribly because of my PTSD. So what you decide to do is up to you. It's absolutely your right, your privilege to decide what you're going to disclose and what you're not going to disclose, to decide who is safe to disclose to and who is not. I'm fairly certain, although I'm not 100% certain, that if you choose to disclose your illness, that that cannot it's not that your boss then then can't run around and tell your coworkers. It can be used by human resources to make appropriate decisions for you in terms of accommodations, but it can't be water cooler talk. So um, it's up to you. You have you get to make the decision. It's not up to your employer. So as with everything in your recovery as much as possible in your recovery, it's under your power. And you get to choose what's right for you or what's not right for you. So um, know that nobody has the right to pull any medical diagnoses out of you and force you to tell. That's your right. So. Um, Is it, isn't that part of HIPAA as well, Bobby? Um, as far as I know, I could be wrong. Um, I thought that HIPAA just governed the health marketplace, but I could be wrong. I thought um, it was about like, um, disclosure of protecting our health diagnoses to whomever, like it sort of protects us. I didn't know that it was in place to protect health organizations. I thought it was in place to protect Oh us. no. It's not in place to protect health organizations. It's just that because health organizations are usually the ones that have that information, that it governs their right to disclose. Their, or actually not their right, but their lack of right to disclose your medical condition to anyone else. Uh, let me do a quick, I'm gonna do a quick Google. Okay. Let's see what Mr. Google tells me about HIPAA in the workplace. Awesome. Um. August is saying that this is why the reason that that Bobby just said was why she doesn't share currently because the person at work that we were referring to likes to gossip and tells co-workers um, and then Angel's just going through a really really rough time like Angel was told and I want to acknowledge Angel and just validate how she's feeling here um, 
I've been told a lot in my adult life, like, oh, well, basically pull up your big girl panties because you got to work around some unlovable people when you're an adult. It's just part of life. And I understand that in the general population of the world, there are going to be unlovable people. My husband calls them love expanders. I call them a-holes. And when we have to work around a-holes or be surrounded by them and they tend to step on our boundaries or they are overtly rude or unkind or abusive in their language or they, they violate our personal space or they have um, covert tactics that are very passive aggressive such as <sighs> rolling of the eyes or things that are not easily proven, those things tend to really mess with your head. And while I, I, I just don't subscribe to the whole pull up your big girl panties, the world is unlovable and you just have to figure it out because that's how life is, life's tough. I understand that there's a level of life's tough, get over it, that is pretty much across the board in the world out there. But there's another level that people take it to, to where it's like bullying and it's almost like warfare, like cyberbullying and just even workplace warfare where people make your work environment so incredibly tense that you just dread coming to work because you know that they're going to be looking and waiting for you to do something so that they can point out to someone that you've done something wrong so that you get pulled on the carpet. I worked in an environment like that and the covert tactics of people who are manipulators and the, the warfare that goes on in the workplace is real. And I want to validate you in that and let you know that it is okay for you to secretly or not so secretly be looking for a different place to work, especially if you're living with post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, diagnosed or undiagnosed. If you are having panic attacks or, tr or you're constantly triggered or you're, or you're having to take medication just to cope with the thought of going to work, I just want to support you and tell you that you're worth it. You're worth finding something that you love and you're worth finding a place that isn't so traumatizing and re-traumatizing for you, especially given the cumulative nature of trauma. Bobby, what did Mr. Google say about HIPAA? Mr. Google says that um, HIPAA has some control over medical information in the workplace and it seems to center more around, it says, the basic legal principle is that employers may not reveal medical information about you unless there is a legitimate business reason to do so, which makes it really vague and fuzzy. Um, they cannot, oftentimes if our health insurance is provided by our employer, then our employer technically has access to that information, but they're not supposed to use that information in a way that is detrimental to you. Um, they're not supposed to share that with anyone else. Um, they're not supposed to discriminate on the basis of your disability. It says state laws may provide you with additional protections. Um, okay, and one thing it says is that HIPAA does not protect your employment records, even if you have health related information in them. So it would not be against the HIPAA laws for your employer to provide someone else with information about your medical conditions that are in your medical that are in your employment files. That is interesting. I think ADA would. Yeah. And maybe civil statutes about privacy, but not HIPAA. HIPAA does not afford you that protection. Okay. Um interesting. Interesting, interesting stuff. Um let's put up the one page. Since we've, we're close to 
running out yeah. of time here. We've answered, a, we've answered a lot of your questions here tonight, so I want to say thank you to all of you who sent in your questions on the No More Shame hashtag. And you can also send us your questions at no more shame project at gmail.com or um, on the little contact tab on any of our websites, no more shame project.com, trauma recovery university.com, and now trauma recovery university live.com, which Yay! is all of your awesome information so that we get to meet you in person in November. Yay. <laughs> okay. Let's look at this one page. Okay, one in four girls and one in six boys. We've discussed these statistics on this broadcast many times over the past two years. RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, has these statistics published on their website at RAIN.org. Approximately 50% of those who were abused as children will develop post-traumatic stress disorder as a child or later in adulthood. Delayed onset post-traumatic stress disorder due to child abuse is not unusual. Hey, Bobby, uh -huh. um, this, this is the only time I'm gonna interrupt the one page. I just wanna remind Harriet um, right now, if at the top of the screen, if she could pop up um, a link to each of the videos, both our PTSD video that is recent and our right. complex PTSD video so that you yes. guys have access to those in case, um, you, I just want you to have easy access to those. Yep. Okay, that's it. I'm not gonna interrupt your one second. <laughs> <laughs> um, and whether we, we can develop either the classic form of PTSD or the complex form. PTSD may leave us with anxiety, triggers, flashbacks, an exaggerated startle response, sensitivity to noise or sense, and sleep disturbances that leave us exhausted every day. Managing PTSD is a challenge at any time, but may feel particularly difficult on the job. And there's several reasons for that. Our culture puts so much value on what one does for a living. Isn't that one of the first questions we get asked when we meet new people? So what do you do, right? Yeah. And the workplace is typically very intolerant of mental health challenges, but we don't have the luxury of not working unless we have an independent source of income or qualify for disability benefits. Unlike being able to cut off contact with toxic family members or avoid romantic relationships while we do our recovery work, we cannot avoid having a job because it triggers us or complicates our recovery. The most important things we can do to mitigate difficulties from PTSD on the job are to proactively work to prevent symptoms from being triggered, and then to prepare to resolve them as quickly as possible after we are triggered. And I really want to emphasize it's about proactivity. That is exactly what it's about in the workforce as much as possible. <laughs> and I started the next sentence with the same phrase, sorry about that. As much as possible, and we recognize it isn't always possible. Choose a job or career field that has both the fewest triggers and the most supportive environment for you. Okay, now I'm just gonna take a break here really quick and emphasize because many of us did not develop our full-blown PTSD until later in life, chances are we'd already chosen our career field and our career was already on track and then boom comes the PTSD and guess what? The career field we had chosen, yeah, not so helpful now. So it is, it can be a very sticky wicket. Plus not everybody gets to choose a career field. You know, sometimes we have to choose what's available. Sometimes we have to choose, you know, what's best for our family 
and not necessarily what's best for us. So we recognize that sometimes choosing your career field um, is a luxury. As it's so to choose, if you can, choose a career field that has both the fewest triggers and the most supportive environment for you. For example, if you're sensitive to loud noises, working in a busy construction site wouldn't be the greatest situation for you. Or if conflict is challenging, working as a collection agent might exacerbate your triggers, flashbacks, and general anxiety. Unfortunately, no method of preventing triggers, flashbacks, or other symptoms of PTSD is foolproof. We get those ninja triggers that come out of nowhere. Yes. But we can proactively prepare to deal with them when they do insert themselves into our workplace. Develop a plan for how you can cope with them on the job. We even suggest you write it out just as you would your crisis management plan. And we have a video about that one, about crisis management plan. It was one of the first ones that we did back in 2014. Harriet, can you pop up the crisis management plan video, please? Just the thumbnail for people to, to click on that. That's a really helpful one. Keep a set of tangible tools on hand to help you ground yourself or stop a flashback. For example, a package of cinnamon candies, lavender oil, a soothing talisman, and a stack of cards with affirmations on them would all be an excellent addition to a trigger or grounding toolkit. Keep it in your desk, in your locker, in your backpack, in your purse, or if you have nothing personal, you know, that you can access on the job, you might have to keep it in your car. Um, you know, not, not everybody has a safe place to keep their things while they're working. So, um, and not everybody has a car, so it's hard. And we recognize that this is not something that is always going to work for everyone. We have to get really creative. And here are more strategies to help you deal with symptoms of PTSD in the workplace. And the first is to get plenty of sleep and eat well in order to give your body all the help it needs to cope with stress, triggers, and anxiety. Develop at least one supportive relationship at work with someone who can help you if you feel overwhelmed with symptoms. If your supervisor or human resources department is safe and supportive, ask for reasonable accommodations for your symptoms. Okay, so for example, when I was working in corporate America, one of the things that I was allowed to do was get up from my desk and go stand outside when I needed to. Um, I told somebody earlier on the Twitter stream, I used to go stand on the loading dock because it was, I don't know why the building had a loading dock. It was obviously meant for another kind of business, but we would never used it. It was an insurance building. Nobody ever came to the loading dock. So I would go out and stand on the loading dock and do deep breathing while I, you know, got myself together. Um, you know, dealt with my trigger or whatever I needed to do to go back in and work. You can ask for reasonable accommodations like that. If you're in the United States, these accommodations are legally available to you. See ADA.gov for information about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in the Americans with Disabilities Act, they don't mean disability in terms of I'm completely disabled, I can't work. They mean if you have a medical condition that interferes with your capacity to do all of the tasks and fulfill all of the expectations on your job. Okay, so it's, it's important to remember that when they say the Americans with Disabilities Act, they don't mean the Americans who are so disabled they can't work. So the American with Disability Act applies to you if you have a medical condition that impacts your ability to be in a work environment and do all of the things that are expected of you. 
this is important to take all of your allowed breaks and utilize rather than store up your vacation days. Um, as survivors, we tend to be perfectionists. And so we can tend to work through our break times and we can tend to not take our vacations. Take them. Take that break time. And I would encourage you, if it's possible, to take your break time and go outside. There's something about being outside in the fresh air that can help ground you. So take your allowed breaks. Take your lunch break. Oy vey, take your lunch break. Um, don't sit at your desk and eat if you have the option not to and use your vacation days. Have as little contact with work responsibilities outside of your work hours. I know that for some of us, that's not always possible. My work goes wherever I go 24-7, 365. And I have to set personal boundaries for myself so that when I get up first thing in the morning and I check my phone and I see I have five Facebook messages, I have to tell myself, no, you don't have to respond to those right now. You can actually have a cup of coffee. You can have breakfast with your child. You don't have to be on call 24-7. Have as little contact, I'm sorry, on to the next one. Practice good time management and organizational skills on the job. This will help minimize anxiety. I know with a lot of survivors that I work with, clutter and a lack of organization skyrockets their anxiety. And so when they're organized, it helps. It also helps when they feel on top of all the tasks they have to accomplish. So time management is important. Distance yourself as much as possible from unhealthy coworkers. Okay, not always possible, especially if that unhealthy coworker is your boss. But as much as you can, distance yourself from toxic and unsafe people at the workplace. Develop a few safe spaces at work where you know you can go to take a deep breath and ground yourself in relative peace and quiet. You know, earlier people were talking about how that had to be the bathroom, and I hate that. I absolutely hate that. Sometimes it's your only option, though. So do whatever you need to do to scout the location out where you work and see if you can find yourself even just a little space where you can go to take refuge. If you work from home, keep clear boundaries between your workspace and your living space. Okay, I'm, I'm bad at this, I admit it. I take my laptop wherever I am. Me in too. House. But, <laughs> but if I had the, what's the word I want? Self-control? There you go, the self-control. I would do this one and it would be healthy for me. So do what I say, not what I do. And realize this is a growth point for me. I need to work on this one. You're working on it. I know you are. Um, if it's necessary for your well-being, change careers. It is never too late to shift into a different job field. You know, you guys, I was um, I was voted to most, li most likely to succeed um, during high school, you know, when we graduated. And... I was one of those people that went into, that chose my career field just after college. And then I dealt with one of the most severe depressive episodes that I've ever had in my lifetime because of the career field that I chose. And it sent me spinning for quite a long time. Um, and I felt tremendous shame for years because I wasn't successful in my career field. And I never went to my high school reunions. I had very little contact with people that I knew from high school because I felt like I had not lived up to my potential. And I would look at my peers who had been in their career fields. I mean, I'm, I'm 50 now, so they had been in their career fields, most of them for more than two decades. 
they were vice presidents, they were presidents, they were, you know, successful doctors, lawyers, business people. And because they had been able to invest two decades in a career. And I hadn't been able to do that because I had to spend two decades investing in my mental health, recovering from my childhood, and deciding that I wanted to live. I didn't find my career path until I was probably about 47 years old. It's hard. I don't have a pension plan. I don't have, you know, my retirement is not secure. But I have a job finally that I love doing and I'm progressing on. So if you have to start over, that's okay. I realize there are limits, especially if you have children who are dependent upon you. Um, there are limits, but you can do it. You can build a career at any age that is supportive of you. It's not easy, and I'm not going to blow sunshine up your skirt and try and tell you that it is. But if it's the best thing and you can do it while still providing for the needs of yourself and your family, then I would encourage you to do it. Um, there's no such thing as I'm too old. So there we go. There goes the one page. How are people doing on the Twitter stream, Ms. Athena? I've been responding to people. I've been just, just leaning back, kicking back over here. Like I'm taking a nap, but I'm not. <laughs> I swear I'm tweeting. <laughs> I'm just leaning back. Okay, here I go. I'm back to work now. Um, everybody's good as far as I can tell. I mean, we're just, honestly, I was just responding to everybody, um, everybody's tweets from earlier when I was sort of on my little soapbox rant and dropped the mic. Um, Laura, <laughs> Laura said, <laughs> Laura said goodnight to us a little bit ago. Uh, Matt says that he has a safe spot that he goes to at work when he needs to get away for a few minutes near a creek beside the office building. It's very peaceful. Um, I, I love that. that. I know, I mean, anything beside a creek, I mean, seriously, sounds wonderful. Um, and August says that, Bobby, you have helped so many people so much, and that shows how great and successful you are. I want to second that, August. Um, August says Thank that... Thank you. <laughs> yes, you are very successful. We've, we've helped a lot of people, and it's amazing. Your guys' emails and tweets and messages um, never cease to amaze us or touch us or make us cry or help us to know that the work we're doing is very, very powerful and important. Um, August has found some safe, empty offices to hide from the world. I remember doing that um, when I was living in Orange County, California, where there's not really any place that you can hide from the world, but... I found some, and um, and we have uh, Phoenix says uh, that her rege her recovery journey started about three years ago, and the PTSD is pretty fresh. And um, as a teacher, she has no way to escape um, when a trigger occurs. So part of her proactive plan is that she has to have her medication. And you guys, I just want to say a little something else. I know that I went on a big old like soapbox rant earlier about medication. I personally don't take medication for my PTSD or for anything that I suffer with, me with mentally with. Um, but, and what I mean is I don't take anything prescription. Now I do take herbal supplements like St. John's wort and valerian root, which is great for depression, um, valerian root, which is great for sleeplessness and anxiety. And I also take an over-the-counter um, doxlamine succinate, 25 milligrams to help me fall asleep at night, which you can find at any Walgreens or Costco or Walmart. Um, but I want to just briefly talk about um, Phoenix nailed it when she said that part of her being proactive is making sure that she has her medication. If you know that you're going into a potentially triggering situation and that if you were to take your medication going into it, it's going to help you, 
there is no shame in needing to do that. I just want to reiterate that there is no shame in needing to take your medication. Um, I remember uh, my general practitioner asked me um, if I wanted to go see the psychiatrist or the psychologist. And I was, I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe I will. Like when I went recently to get all of my physical and blood work and blood panel and everything, I'm healthier right now than I've ever been my whole entire life and I'm 42 years old. So I was thinking, well, maybe, like I'm not sure if I want to go to the psychologist, psychiatrist. I feel like um, I've already did my EMDR. I've done my therapy and my counseling and um, I volunteer and I advocate for others and this is all like work that I love to do and I'm healthier than I've ever been. And I had a loved one say, oh, well, you don't want to do that because they're just going to try to put you on some pills. And I got pretty pissed off. I felt very judged. And I'm first of all, that person meant well, but they're ignorant. They're, they're coming from a place of ignorance. And, and I'm not using that as a derogatory term. They are just ignorant to the facts that if a general practitioner says, would you like to go to behavioral medicine and talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist about what you're experiencing, that's what the doctor's recommending. And if the doctor's recommending it, then they hold more weight than what your loved ones might want to talk about. So in order for me to manage my PTSD, I have set myself up for success by going through my crisis management plan, knowing ahead of time what it is that I need to set myself up for success. Like I know how many minutes I need to wake up early. I know what I need to do in my day. I know that I need like 15 to 20 minutes in the morning minimum quiet time. Just I have Bible reading time. I'm a woman of, woman of faith. I have prayer time. I'm, I'm mindful, I'm fully present in my body, I don't let my mind go off like into a million different directions because man, it will. Um, I really set my intention for the day and I just need to remind myself that I am showing up as the best version of myself that I could possibly be today. And that's just part of my setting myself up for success. I do need to take into consideration more with the spearmint or the cinnamon candies um, I do love to go for a drive in my truck. Um, if I get an emotional, I had an emotional flashback last night before bed and I had to breathe my way through it. And it was something manini. It was just a small, tiny thing, but it felt big and real. And I didn't know how to navigate my way through it. And I just had to remember the things that I read in the Richard Grennan and Layla Lorick book. I know I sound like a broken record, but go and click the link and buy the book, How to Stop an Emotional Flashback. And I just went through my steps and I just, I breathed my way through it. I reminded myself where I was. I reminded myself what day it was, what year it is, where I am. I'm in my bedroom. I am safe. I am safe. I must repeat to myself over and over and over again so many times a day, reminding myself that I'm safe now. I just need to be reminded that I'm safe. I spent a lot of years in my life not so safe. Even when I was away from my primary abuser, living on my own, I had people that would stop by just unannounced whenever they felt like it, people in my family, just because they wanted to. And anytime I would try to bring up anything or ask questions about my childhood or whatever, they would divert my attention into 12 different directions and tell me that I was crazy and that I must be remembering it wrong. And you guys, that's re-traumatizing. And if you're dealing with PTSD, if you're dealing with complex PTSD, if you're dealing with emotional flashbacks, if you're dealing with triggers, and then you're trying to go to work and function and do an excellent job at work so that you have a good feeling of a sense of accomplishment, you're going to need to set your intention early on in the day. You're going to need to wake up a few minutes earlier. You're going to need to sit and Google DBT, Google Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, and Google, there's a workbook that I highly recommend. It's over on my desk right there, and I need to, I need to get the link and put it down below. But on page 226 or 227 of that particular workbook, it talks about 15 minutes, five little things that you can do for three minutes each, 15 minutes. And it really, when you do that over and over and over and over and over again, every day, every day, every day, you feel a difference in the first three or four days. I challenge my clients. I tell them, give it three days. Give it three days. If you don't notice a difference, quit. Just quit. It's okay. It makes a difference. 
being emotionally regulated and setting yourself up for success is huge. So I can't advocate for that enough. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your support of this awesome community and for the work that Bobby and I do for the survivor community and just just for being awesome, just for being amazing. We're going to transition our broadcast now briefly for the next 10 minutes just to let people know how they can reach us and all of that and just welcome them. But if you show up here every week and you're a member of our community and you're already plugged into some online safe groups where you feel like you get all the support that you really need and you've made some friends and you have some safe people in your life, then great. Thanks for being here. We are honored by your presence. And we're so grateful for you. We couldn't show up and do this every week without you. So thank you. And if you're brand new, um, we're going to transition. Bobby has some screen shares. And Bobby, did you have anything that you wanted to say to everybody? I know this is a really tough topic, but did you want to say anything to everybody before we transition into um, welcoming people? Uh, go register for the conference. TraumaRecoveryUniversityLive.com. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Harriet, will you put like right here by my finger, trauma recovery university live.com? Can you link it in one of the YouTube cards? Because you're amazing. Um, but yeah, guys, just check out our labor of love. It took us six weeks. I worked 12, 15, 17 hour days some days, and the website turned out really freaking amazing, if I do say so myself. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, God. So, Check out the website, register for the conference, and like Bobby said, we're just honored that you're here. We're so honored that you're here, and we can't wait to meet you in person, and we're just going to continue to be um, designing a conference experience that is super, super, super special, and we have you in mind. So um, if you're new here, then stick around for five or ten minutes as we tell you who we are and how to get in touch with us and how to get plugged in with other people who have lived similar situations to you where they can um, help you to feel not so alone. All right. Let us look at ways to connect with us. Contact us. There we go. Um, we're going to give you email addresses, Twitter handles, Facebook pages, YouTube, Roku TV, Google Plus. Um, please keep in mind, at this point, it is still just Athena and I doing much of this work. So if we don't respond right away, please, it's not personal. It's just that we're a tad bit swamped. So we do our best to reply within 48 hours. If you would like to email us, you can reach me at bobbylparish at gmail.com. You can reach Athena at athenamobergspeaking at gmail.com. And you can reach us jointly at nomoreshameproject at gmail.com. Uh, on Twitter, I am Bobby L. Parrish. Athena is Athena Moberg. And Trauma Recovery University is Trauma Recovery U. Capitals don't matter on Twitter. If you would like to watch any and all of our videos, you can find them on YouTube, Roku TV, or Google Plus. Just for, search for Trauma Recovery University. If you would like to connect with us on Facebook, and Athena and I would love to be your friend on Facebook, you can uh, reach out to us. You can like the Trauma Recovery University page. There's my professional page, Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. My personal page, which is Bobby Parrish. Athena's Facebook page for her business is Athena Moberg Speaking. And her personal page is Dawn Athena Moberg. You can access Trauma Recovery University anytime, 24-7, 365, using the hashtag bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you. And those capitals do matter. Bitly likes capitals. Twitter does not matter. Okay, let's put up. Oh, da 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 da. da. There's a little music there while I switch screenshots. Okay. Here we go at the conference. I'll be
be singing and dancing while we change um, PowerPoint slides. <laughs> Ooh, too, too big, too big. Okay. These are ways that you can join us in safe community. All of them are free and they will always be free. We have three Twitter chats every week. The first is on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific or 6 p.m. in the UK. The hashtag is CSAQT. Um, and then there's Monday evening, which is if you're with us live, the video slash Twitter chat that we have on Monday evenings is at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 Eastern or 2 o'clock in the morning UK time. And that hashtag is no more shame. If you zip over there on the right hand side, you can see real quick that you can join us each week at bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you. And then there is the final Twitter chat of the week on Tuesday nights using the hashtag sex abuse chat. And this is the um, original Twitter chat that was started by uh, Rachel Thompson and myself back in January of 2014. And this is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern and 2 o'clock Wednesday mornings in the UK. If you would like to join one of our Facebook support groups, you may do so by using this four step process. And the first thing is to like the Trauma Recovery University page, then to send Athena and I friend requests. After we have accepted those friend requests, please message us saying, I'd like to heal in safe community or something similar to that. I'd like to join one of your support groups, Please don't message us before we accept your friend request because then your message goes into this um, deep bottomless pit of a folder called other and we have no idea what gets dropped into that pit and, and Facebook never tells us when something gets dropped into that pit. So wait for us to accept your friend request and then send the message. We will then when we get your message as soon as we can we'll get back to you. Um, we might ask you some questions about yourself if we don't already know you. And the reason for that is we're trying to determine that you are safe and you are not a predator. Once we have done that, then we will welcome you into one of our support groups. And it's that simple and that easy. There we go. There we go. Now, <laughs> Go check out the Trauma Recovery University Live website. Yay! Yay, Harriet, pop up the link to the website, Trauma Recovery University Live. Or is it over here? I forget where the YouTube cards go. Little YouTube card that will pop down. Um, anyway, you guys, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being the most important and awesome part of our week. Um, this community is incredible and beautiful because of you. And Bobby and I get to do what we love for a living because of you. So thank you. And we can't wait to meet you in person in Orlando, Florida, November 11th through the 13th, 2016 at the beautiful Embassy Suites Orlando Lake Buena Vista Resort. And um, there are links all over the website where you can get a discounted rate. It gives you all the choices for all of the tickets. There's different ticket options, different packages that are huge money savers. You can literally save up to 50% if you book before September 1st. So, and um, someone in our community, several people in our community actually, um, did uh, some research to find out um, with the airlines when the most affordable day or most cost effective day is to purchase an airline ticket in the in the airline ticket industry and what they found out is it's 63 days out from your trip on a Tuesday so just so I can save you the time of going through your calendar September 13th is the most cost-effective day for you to purchase your flight if you're flying to our conference so um, 
I think it, or maybe it was 57 days out, something like that. Anyway, it was a Tuesday, and it, I think, and it's September 13th, I believe, is the date that is the most cost-effective day to purchase your ticket to come to Trauma Recovery University Live 2016, which we are super duper excited about. Um, and we else? have what we have a Facebook like? group that we have started for everyone who has registered to go to the conference. Yes. So once you've registered, if you're on Facebook, we'll add you, and that way you can get a chance to meet people and interact with them and let us come in and share announcements about awesome things that are going to happen at the conference there in the Facebook group. So um, it's a great way to get to know people so that when you get there in November, you won't feel like you're all alone. Yeah, you'll kind of feel like you already like you already kind of know people because you've met them and developed a friendship with them ahead of time. So I know Bobby and I became business partners and we had never met in person. We were working together for, um, let's see. Uh, we were working together for 10 and a half, almost 11 months, almost a year before we met in person. We worked virtually just like this on Google Hangout or Skype. Yep. Um, we're not, we're not, a. we don't have a preference of either Google Hangout or Skype. It just depends on which one has the least amount of tech gremlins going on at the <laughs> moment. So, um, anything else for our lovely peeps, Bobby, before we say goodbye? Uh, next week we're going to talk about aha moments or light bulb moments or those awesome times when things all click together and you understand something in a way you've never understood it before, when the puzzle pieces fall into place. And what we're going to be doing is sharing your aha moments just like as well as ours. So come next week, next Monday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, and share your light bulb moments with us. Mm -hmm. And maybe someone else will have a light bulb from your light bulb. You know, that is, that's a good point. A lot of people have light bulb moments or aha moments in response to something that somebody else shared. So in fact, that happens to Bobby and I all the time. Like we'll be talking or we'll be in a business meeting or something, I'll be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I just realized something, oh my gosh. So. Yeah. I can't wait to share everybody's um, moments. Now, it can be anything. It can be like, oh my gosh, this is when I realized that I had like more healing to do. Or this is when I realized, oh my gosh, all the hard work that I've been putting in is really paying off. Or, yeah. wow, I noticed that the old me would have responded this way. And instead, I responded this way. And, right. you know, like that's, that's an aha moment. That's like, wow, okay. And let me just, sh let me just, okay, spoiler alert. We survivors are minimizers. And we want to find 12 reasons why a light bulb moment was no big deal. Well, I, that's what I should have been doing all along. No. No minimizing allowed. Aha moments and light bulb moments are, they're, they're celebratory. They're like, wow, okay all of my hard work is paying off. Wow. And it, it's easy for us to get caught up in this whole, the drudgery of recovering from something or uncovering who it is that we really are. And we're finding ourselves after all these years, for sometimes the very first time. So um, it's very exciting and it's a celebratory moment to know, wow, I'm on this path and I just had something revealed to me in a way that was never revealed to me before. And I want to celebrate that. So um, no minimizing allowed. They're a big deal. And, and as small as it might, you think it might seem to somebody else, it could be a really big deal. And just remember, where you're at on your journey could be years down the road of where someone else is at. And they just need to know that it's possible. They, sometimes people just need to know that it's possible to just get past fill in the blank. Yep. People need hope. And we are here. In closing, we will say, Bobby and I love, we, we love to share hope. We are here sharing a message of hope and healing to this community. And we get to do it week after week during live Q&A and during all of the support groups and all the Twitter chats and everything. So... We love sharing everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. That is why we're here. 
And that is our objective. We really want to improve the outcomes for all of you and help your recovery journey to be shorter than ours was. And we're succeeding. We're succeeding. We've met our goal and we're going to continue to do that. So um, there is hope. There is hope. I swear there is hope. I promise there is hope. And um, Bobby, Bobby's helped me a lot just by sharing her experiences and sharing her recovery journey. I always realize something new and fresh about myself or my journey or one of my clients and their recovery journey. And um, it, it, just, it just helps. The, the power of safe community and being able to share your experiences is truly healing and life changing. It is. That's why we want to meet you at the conference. So come yes. on, y'all. <laughs> we want to meet you in person, and we want to, uh, yeah, we want to meet. We want to meet you in person. So uh, we look forward to meeting you in person. We look forward to seeing you back here next week for live Q and A Monday on the topic of light bulb moments or aha moments during your recovery. And thank you for spending this evening with us. I'm Athena Moberg, and this is Bobby Parrish, and we. Love bringing you everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. Bye, everyone.